Hey everyone and welcome back to another edition of The Roundup. Today we've got some like seriously important stuff to cover. We've got one story that kind of threatens modding in principle that's really worrying. And then also what seems to be Valve's official and a little bit creepy move into China with Steam. And of course, a bunch of other stories as well. Now, if you'd like to help us out and also get some early access to our content, also the Daily Briefing, which is our super condensed news service over on Patreon, and uh, even a, a big old stack of physical loot from a game team stuff like this, this concept from a, a game pitch we ended up working on, uh, then Patreon is a place to seriously help us out. Past that, of course, like, sub, check out the State of Gaming series, and with that said, let's get right into the news. First up, it looks like the Steam China client has actually entered alpha over the weekend, and this is something that I think is in some ways a bit spooky. Certainly though, it's very interesting and something you should be aware of. So while the servers are still offline, some newly surfaced images are actually giving us a bit of a glimpse into how this region locked, censored, and localized version of Steam will operate. It's funny, users launching any game from their library will be met with a healthy gaming advisory message that encourages players to be mindful that, quote, well-planned use of your time will lead to a healthy lifestyle. So, yeah, hmm, there's that. Now, Steam China also does not appear to be able to be displaying customized pictures or usernames, instead defaulting to a question mark image and a randomly generated string of digits. Now, Steam's handles and images, they've always been editable, right? They've yielded some uh, fun, interesting results at times. It's just a fun part of personal expression that Steam users have. And we all know how China feels about that sort of thing. Like, tensions in Hong Kong are actually picking up, like, literally right now it's all sort of heating up again uh, just new laws and stuff and you know if people were to as an example swap their steam profile image over to that of an umbrella that would be seen as a symbol of protest and it would not go down that well and basically this issue of self-expression uh, is a big thing over there uh, where really they would want some form of censorship apparatus actually existing to process that and this whole thing actually is what seems to have led to animal crossing imports actually being put by regional retailers because Animal Crossing, of course, has got lots of self-expression in it. And if there's not the censorship apparatus to be able to pull things from that easily, then obviously that would, uh, you know, that would have issues with government policy. Then finally, the most significant change issued thus far is that Steam China restricts certain games from being played outside of particular times of the day. So launching CSGO at 5 a.m. Chinese time returns the message, you can't play this game between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m am the following day. Please take a break. Yeah, you don't want one of those naughty, sweaty gamers, do you? Now, this is the same for uh, Dota 2 as well, uh, though other titles can be played normally. Uh, both, of course, CSGO and Dota 2 have actually been officially released in China, which would explain why their time management restrictions are already functional and in place. Of course, though, this whole thing is a huge sign of things to come on the platform. It's something I don't think, say, the Americans should have to worry about, but in the uh, DCMS uh, committee hearings over in the UK about, you know, responsible games, and all of that, what happened? Well, we did hear, you know, China-like restrictions uh, be praised by certain elements there and certain sort of interest groups. So there's certainly a worry here. Yeah, the types of things that are going to be normal in China are not going to be normal in most, like, Western nations. But at the end of the day, we should keep an eye here because those not that good things, they're going to happen over there first. But we've also got to be sure they don't happen over here. Do you want to fire up Steam someday, right? And uh, have Steam say, no, you can't play your game right Right now because you know the government said that gaming happens between these hours i don't think that's something we want to have happen and that's why we need to pay attention to these things even if they do seem boring and far away then there's also the fact that there are, you know, many, like, what, hundreds of millions of people who will have, you know, who are gamers, you know, just like us, and who are going to be having these restrictions, and, you know, that sucks for them as well. Then another aspect of this is that it's been long said that Chinese indie devs have been wary about a region-locked version of Steam appearing. Basically, right, the Chinese government is already, uh, you know, censoring the likes of, you know, like, Facebook and stuff like that, but, uh, so, you know, that's not really something you can go and do. But Steam has actually been free really accessible to, uh, I think, 30 million Chinese gamers. Now, Steam has been a bit of a loophole in the CCP's censorship plan for a while, but uh, 
uh, you know, that's not been good for the CCP, but for Chinese independent developers, it's actually been this lifeline because they could put their things in Steam, and then even a local audience could still play them. And that was great for the state of Chinese independent game development. However, something like Steam China, especially if it meant that mainline Steam would go away over there, that would be very bad for those developers. Now, Steam China does promise to offer a better experience to users in mainland China when it finally launches, though while it will have local servers and localized games, which I guess is pretty cool, the rest of the marketing does seem very unlikely. The storefront will be incredibly emaciated by its international counterpart standards, reportedly launching with about 40 games, thanks to, of course, um, the government's stringent licensing policies. Steam China will exist in isolation, and the change has prompted many commenters to wonder how this will impact the, you know, the international version of Steam and if there'll be any things bleeding out. Now, that said, based on what Valve are like, like Valve are a pretty libertarian company, I find it very hard to believe that even though they obviously want the dollar from that region in this way, uh, you know, I find it very hard to believe they would actually enforce anything like that or even allow anything like that in their more core markets. I guess also then, like some have, you know, sort of said that Valve is a bit complicit in enabling Chinese state censorship for the sake of expanding their market, and that is something that a lot of American and European companies are actually criticized by, or, you know, for, by their users. And then others, of course, have also played up the quietness of the Steam China soft launch, as if to say that, you know, it's just trying to fly under the radar. I suppose the question here is, what exactly is Valve supposed to do? Let the entire Chinese market go? I mean, somehow that doesn't really seem too likely. Anyway, I know this is not the most hype story for, for most of us because it does all feel very far away, very disconnected from our own personal gaming experiences, but I don't think that's actually a good reason not to care because this does impact a lot of people and we should always be aware of what could come down upon us in 20 years, in 30 years, 50 years, if we're not careful. And then next up, we've got a 10 cent story. They are continuing their wave of acquisitions, this time looking to Japan. So Bloomberg have reported that uh, Tencent, the big Chinese tech conglomerate, are in the process of buying a 20% stake in Japan's Marvelous Inc. Now this 65 million investment will make Tencent the largest single entity shareholder in Marvelous. Now Marvelous, who oversee the likes of Damon X Machina, uh, Story of Seasons, which is kind of like the, the real Harvest Moon now, and Sanran Kagura, which is certainly his own beast, uh, they'll be using that money to expand their existing franchises, launch new ones, and bring more games to the West. Now, on this analyst, um, Hideaki Yasuda adds that the deal will allow Marvelous to ride through this whole period of global uh, economic uncertainty, but I think what's more important is he also suggested that this uh, part of Tencent's investment is actually Tencent trying to get their foot in the door with Japanese console development, and that's something that he actually calls, and I quote, one of the last frontiers for Tencent sense global gaming ambitions and I mean if that's correct then yes yeah, certainly conquer Japan they're already of course are very very invested into the West and of course into their own home region and that just just does mean that if gaming grows in any part of the world you know it's having a globally diversified portfolio it exists in the stock market and in a situation like this for Tencent yeah they're just going to be able to capture broad sector growth now, as to the sort of precedent this could set, other analysts actually do believe that this could only be the first in several similar deals. So, Tokyo consultant uh, Sir Kan Toto believes that Japan Inc. will not be able to withstand Chinese game companies much longer. That's a quote from him. Uh, Tencent's influence is fairly overwhelming at this stage. It really is across so much of gaming, and certainly tapping into Japanese console gaming expertise, that'll be another string in their, I think now, very, very powerful bow. Uh, Toto adds that Marvelous, uh, who cover, of course, anime, comics, and games, were a great target for Tencent specifically. So, that's what's going on there. And man, you know, we've been doing this State of the Publishers series. Oh, wow. I mean, if we end up doing a State of Tencent, that's going to take several hours to actually work out just where are all their investments. Anyway, let's move on. So even if you're not into sports, this is, a, I think, a pretty important one to actually understand from the sake of just, pr like, principles. Right, Sega. They're in a bit of a jam right now over Football Manager, where they're being sued by Manchester United, a football club. Essentially, United are upset that a simplified version of their logo is being used alongside their name. Now, Sega are arguing here that it's a perfectly reasonable thing to use the real name of a football team in a video game about football, and that the crest is randomly generated by the game. Game. Now, both the name and the logo have been used in the franchise since 1992 with no complaints, and 
United sometimes even consult the databases for scouting reports, so it's a bit weird. Then also, club lawyers uh, requested an amendment to cover, and this is the big bit, mods that would allow players to create their own crests, claiming that that actually allows Sega to benefit from their image without having a license. And believe me, no matter what type of games you're playing, that is the bit that really does matter to you. We'll get onto it in a second, though. Now, Sega are not backing down here. Essentially, they're coming up with the counter-argument of, this has been fine for years, so what are you doing? Shut up. It's kind of unclear here what Manchester United really expected from this. They're basically starting a fight out of nowhere for something that was okay for 30 years, right? And having 30 years of precedent when it comes to stuff like copyrights, that actually is a thing that can hold up in court. It's the, That's why so many companies have to aggressively and almost preemptively defend their copyrights, so it's a bit weird. Now, the club's lawyer also repeatedly brought up how lucrative licenses can be, so that's probably what they want. Now, a cursory glance of sporting news here in the UK does reveal that Manchester United's net debt has increased by 127 million million pounds in the last year, so maybe that's why they're on the hunt for some more money. Still though, here's the core bit. I would worry about this being a normal practice, right? And that if that happened, we'd see a tightening of mod policies. Basically, it's the idea that if allowing modding in your game and you're a developer, if that just means that you're then opened up to loads of legal hassle and that you actually have like a more full amount of liability for any copyright abuses that happen because of mods made for your game, then that could be really bad for modding, right? That could just mean the loads of devs would decide, you know what, maybe we're not going to do modding because we don't want all that trouble. And then next, an update to that lawsuit between Ubisoft and Apple and Google. Basically, Ubi have dropped their lawsuit against Apple and Google following confirmation that the Rainbow Six Siege blatant clone, Area F2, was actually removed from the app stores. Ejoy.com, the developers of this near-carbon copy, pulled the title from download over the weekend. I think they probably just saw the writing was on the wall. Uh, their suit uh, with Ubisoft has also been dropped. So that's basically what's happened. I mean, look, when a game is as popular as Siege, there's always going to be imitators who just want to get there, grab a slice of that pie. Ubisoft, you know, they were well within their rights to protect their IP. It's a bit shocking how unwilling Google and Apple were to take action there, but hey, there you go. The situation was resolved, and I think in at least the, the way that it should have, right? It, that game should not have been up there. That was pretty clear. So good stuff for Ubisoft. Let's move on to the final story. Well, if you are big into the character action games, I've got good news for you. Platinum Games have been quiet about Bayonetta 3 since it was announced in 2017, but it's still coming. Basically, Kamiya has advised fans to take any concerns they have and throw them out the window immediately. That last bit was the quote, because the team are hard at work on the new installment. So there you go. Your concerns are out the window. Congratulations. Uh, with the wonderful 101 remastered uh, now being out the door, I guess it's sort of unclear what's next for Platinum Games. Bayonetta could very well be their top priority right now. It could also be Project GG. Uh, that was confirmed to be the um, the title that they teased last year as being unlike anything else. So there you go. Whatever's next, it'll probably be worth uh, talking about. I think they're an interesting bunch. But hey, be careful if uh, Cammy's about on Twitter, though, because uh, he might just get you to throw something else out the window. Anyway, there you go. That is your gaming news for today. So there we go, a big old stack of news. Slightly change up the format today. I just want to see, like, with doing, you know, the voiceover, right? That actually just gives me way more control over delivery than doing, like, a sort of a two-camera with a script setup. So I want to see how that goes over. Also, yeah, thumbnails, we may be tweaking them up a bit. We're just running some experiments uh, to, to see what the crack is, essentially. So that's just what to expect there. Just kind of boring, you know, behind the scenes nuts and bolts of doing YouTube and sort of adhering to what the platform just really would love for us to do as creators, you know other than making the core content just kind of sad. Anyway, that is what's up. Uh, thanks for watching. Let me know what you thought about today's stories, and I'll see you all next time.